Welcome, everybody, to Red Hat Summit. Hope you guys enjoyed the keynote stuff this morning, and hope you had a first good session. Uh, maybe that woke you up a little bit. And everybody <laughs> will stay lively for this one. So uh, this is Gluster Can Do That. So we are here to talk about Gluster architecture. This is a fairly technical session. Uh, it's fairly fast paced, so we have quite a bit of content we want to throw at you. Um, uh, we do keep it pretty flexible here, though, so um, if you want to interrupt in the middle and ask a question, feel free. If you want to wait to the end, if you want to grab us afterwards, you'll find us hanging out in booths down in the partner pavilion and around, so it won't be too hard to find us. I am Dustin Black. I am a senior architect with uh, our storage business unit, so I'm actually helping to build uh, reference architectures and work with our partners uh, and performance and sizing guides, so there's a lot of this uh, uh, content that I build to kind of help you guys out to make sure that the work you do is right. And my hey. partner today. Yep, I'm Ben Turner. I'm a principal software quality engineer. Um, I work on both Gloucester and Ceph. I do a lot of performance testing. Um, I wrote a tool called GBench, and I'm really interested in any sort of performance automated regression testing. Also, if you forgive me if I have this, I was uh, in a battle with a razor this morning, and it's <laughs> the razor quite, one. quite a flesh wound, yeah. So <laughs> don't let this distract you, and uh, yeah, I'll keep it to. So, <laughs> so we're gonna troll you first. Um, uh, as I said, we, we've got quite a bit we wanna cover. Uh, we, we don't really have a time to do a full-blown what is Gluster. I'll, I'll do a quick survey of the audience. Uh, Gluster users today, in production? Nice. Oh, most of the hands stayed up. All right, good deal. Um, so uh, how about Ceph, just out of curiosity? Ceph users? All right, very cool. Um, so we're not going to give you the, uh, the full 101, but if you follow along really quickly, we can tell you exactly how everything <laughs> works in that. Okay, that's the strategy. Everybody got it. <laughs> good. Okay, um, the good thing is if you did miss it, uh, feel free to snap a shot of that. We do have a set of slides. Uh, that are hosted on my people page, so you can actually go through all of those 101 slides uh, on your own time as you like to. So I'll give you guys half a second. Yeah, Three, he, he moves a little two. quick for me too, so <laughs> don't feel bad if you missed it. You can always tag us too. You can go to my people page, people.redhat.com slash dblack, and you'll find the, the link to it there anyway. So what are we going to do? Gluster can do that if you build it right. So that's kind of the big caveat we're, we're sticking to today is is all the, what this is all about is making sure you make the right decisions up front. So we're going to be focusing on what it means to make those decisions up front. So the first thing I want to cover is uh, some testing that we did with a number of different scenarios. So this is a, you know, first of all, let's say that uh, our resources for this test were confined to a, a certain architecture of uh, six node clusters that we had kind of cherry picked to say, you know, this is a good uh, cluster node. But I've got six of them. Now I can configure those six clusters with their uh, 72 total drives, I think, yeah, the 12 drives per system, uh, 72 total drives, I can configure them a number of different ways for, you know, redundancy and uh, different ways of using cluster volumes, and based on the way that I configure them, I'm going to get pretty massively diff different results. So keep in mind, when I show you the data that I'm showing you, this is all data tested on the same systems, just configured different ways for different workloads. So one of the things we want to show you here is this is representative of a what we consider a very small file workload. So 32 kilobyte files, it's like a JPEG file. Uh, and let's say you just kind of throw it out there, just do kind of a default configuration, you don't think much about it. Okay, so maybe you can get 1,700 JPEGs processed per second. Not bad. But let's say you spend a little time actually tuning to that workload. And, and you'll see, I shouldn't really say tuning, we'll get into that later. But uh, let's say you architect to that workload up front make the right decisions, and you suddenly go from 1,700 JPEGs to almost a tenfold increase to 12,000 JPEGs per second. Same hardware. We didn't change any of our hardware investment in this case. We didn't change any of our software investment in this case. We just changed the way we used it. And if you want to go to the extreme end, you'll see I have some SSD examples on these as well. Um, we did do some SSD testing so you can see if what you really need is a performance-based configuration, you can do it. Uh, this is a, an all NVMe configuration that we tested. Uh, and you can see we got 23,000. What may be interesting there is that we only really doubled our optimized hard drive-based configuration. Uh, this is kind of a limitation of small files that we'll get into a little bit later. So same nodes, same nodes, configured a slightly different way uh, and different workload here. So this time we have a four gigabyte-based DVD kind of representative workload. Uh, so what can we push through the system with this? So again, not really putting a whole lot of effort into it. What we get is a DVD per second. Pretty decent, right? But let's take some time and configure that workload appropriately. Two DVDs a second. Okay, so again, same hardware. 
or go to the SSD route, we may be able to push this thing up to four DVDs a second. But again, the, the first two are same hardware configured different ways. The last one is actually a different hardware configuration. And our third example here is let's take a look at a real world workload. So something we studied was a CCTV workload. Uh, and, and again, no configuration, no, no real effort put into that. We can get 200 concurrent CCTV streams on that same set of servers. Uh, or we can configure to that workload, architect appropriately to it, and more than double the capacity of the system. So this is the key point that we're gonna be hitting on today in, in everything that we talk about in these performance numbers. Um, so what it boils down to, you, you guys are familiar with the, um, uh, the acronym KISS, right? <laughs> right? Rock and roll all night, yeah, that's KISS. <laughs> that's the wrong KISS, Ben. Uh oh, jeez. Um, okay, KISS. Well, did, at you, least, did you change that font? Yeah, okay. at least the font's right. <laughs> all right. Um, keep it simple, stupid. Um, so we, we were thinking about this and, and kind of how we could apply the same sort of mnemonic mm -hmm. to uh, what we have going on because we want you to concentrate on the right thing. So we came up with our own acronym. It's <laughs> it didn't work out all that well. Yeah, I think um, we should have bought a vowel. Yeah, I think so. So it, it makes a good point, though. What we, wanted, what we want to get across to you today, start with the workload dummy. Mm -hmm. All right, this is really important. Um, if you don't understand your workload and you go architecting your storage environment to work for that workload, it's never going to work right for that workload. Mm -hmm. So know your workload first. Uh, talk to your architects about what your workload is so that we can actually help make those right decisions up front because you will ne we'll, we'll reinforce this later, mm -hmm. but you will never tune your way out of a performance problem yep. if you architect it improperly in the first place. So let's take a look at how this kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, affects us uh, as engineers and, and support guys uh, on a daily basis. Um, and it all has to do, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I've anonymized this, and I apologize to some of my colleagues that um, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat publicly shaming them, but at least they're not uh, uh, called out by name here. <laughs> um, but these are real emails that we get, mm -hmm. um, and some of the problems that we run into. So, you know, like in this case, somebody saying, uh, I, 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 have, I need a new system to perform similarly to an existing system. I did a test with DD, and I got good write throughput, 500 megabytes per second, I don't, is that good? I don't know, I, there's not enough information yeah. here. It's a rep two configuration, you get 10 gig connection. Uh, rep two over how many nodes? Yep. I don't think it, yeah, it doesn't What record stay. size did you write with? How did you run DD? What was your input mm -hmm. to DD? Mm -hmm. Is this an NFS mount or a fuse mount? Does it say? <laughs> yeah. Is there, um, okay, and DD strangely yields slower, bleh. DD strangely yields slower throughput for reads. Um, which is, you'll see by all the chart numbers that we have, reads always on Gluster outperform writes. I mean, almost almost all the time. Yep. Unless so, you go to like a pure distribute volume, but right. most, most but they, they cases say here involve it's replication, replication, so yeah. So um, there's just, these are the kinds of questions we get, right? There's not enough information here for us to even answer this question. There's not enough information about the workload. Similar thing, um, this is somebody, they want to add physical nodes to increase performance. I did not add those quotes, <laughs> performance. Um, they're experiencing a problem. Uh, they do give us some information, okay, 80 by two-way distributed replicated volume on six nodes. They want to add six nodes, which would not still be an 80 by two-way. If it stays, it would be a 160 by two-way. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of missed information there. Um, and so they're asking, to get better performance, how do I need to add these nodes to the system? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, do you know, Ben? Yeah, I don't I, know. I think we've got to start with the workload. Though. Yeah, I think we need to start with the workload. So we're missing here, once again, we don't really have enough information about what performance means to them. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of file sizes are they using? Is it random? Is it sequential? Is it a mix of small and large files? Is it latency sensitive? Is it throughput sensitive? Uh, how many concurrent clients are happening? Is it a Fuse mm -hmm. client? Is it an NFS mm -hmm. client? There's, there's so much we need to know to make the right decisions, yep. and it's not provided. And something else that we'll cover on a little bit more later is there is like a workload like make dir. It might it, It's one of the few things in Gluster that doesn't scale positively linearly. So with Mictor, the, the more bricks you have, uh, it tends to slow down a little bit. So if they're doing a really Mictor heavy workload, that might actually hurt their performance a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of an oddity, mm -hmm. right? Because we, we do talk about linear scalability and improving performance by adding nodes. But again, if you, if you don't understand what that workload is and how you built against it, you could actually add nodes and slow everything down. Mm -hmm. So be careful. Uh, last example we'll do here is somebody saying, okay, we need a certain number of IOPS per drive slash RAID, <laughs> but what's an IOP? Uh, well, it depends. Does anybody know what an IOP is? Okay, you can tell me what the definition of an IOP is, sure. You all know what an IOP is, but how big is that IOP? 
you know, how many clients are performing that? I, when they say mm -hmm. per disk per RAID volume, how does that really translate to the, there's, again, there's not enough information here. I will go on a soapbox rant all the time when somebody asks me uh, to design a Gluster file system and they want a certain number of IOPS, mm -hmm. and especially if they just say they want IOPS, I'll just tell them to go away because there's just, there's not enough information in an IOP to design a file system to meet that mm -hmm. requirement. Yeah. Uh, we've got to know more. Yep, it's, it's, it's pretty tricky whenever you're working with IOPS. Something that I personally like to see a little bit more is files per second. I think that's a better metric. And I think it's something that we cover a bit more later on in the presentation. Yeah, you'll find when we show you some of our, our small file workload numbers that we report those in files per second. Mm -hmm. uh, the tool that we use, we use a tool written by one of our fellow Red Hatters, Ben England, uh, called Small File. Uh, that actually will, will do these small file transactions, reports files per second, which is nice because it's, a, it's kind of a nice abstraction of throughput and latency, mm -hmm. which is really when you're using a file system, what's important. If you know what your file size is, what's important to you is how many of those files can I push through the system at, the, at a time. Mm -hmm. And it's not as important exactly what the throughput is or exactly what the latency is. It's just important that I can get the number of files through the system that I need at a given mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Cool. Here comes a workload. <laughs> All right, so let's actually take, we're going to take a, 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 a deeper dive into the, the workloads that I introduced early in the slides. So first of all, this small file JPEG workload. Again, this is a 32 kilobyte workload, and I want to explain a few things about what my team was doing with these tests. Um, because if you guys are used to studying uh, performance purely, you're going to find that some of these numbers may look a little funny. That's because what we are interested in, uh, in the document that we're publishing, which I will plug real quickly because... We finally actually have this document. This is a reference architecture for Gluster that we've been working on, a performance and size guide. It's pretty lengthy, but it goes into all of this detail that we're talking about today and more. Um, so what we wanted to find was actually a throughput efficiency. We want you, as the person who's implementing this, to understand that if performance is important to you, what is your performance per, per investment? So we don't do a pure performance number here. We actually divide performance by the number of disks or drives that are actually in the system. Uh, regardless of the replication that's actually being used or the data protection mechanism, because we want you to know that what your investment is in the system returns you a certain amount of performance. Uh, so that said, if you take a look at the small file workload, again, all of these configurations that you see down that, that y-axis are all the same hardware, just configured in different ways. We haven't changed anything about that hardware. Uh, so you'll see among those configurations, we have the best performing option is at the top using the Gluster native client uh, that's 12 disks in a RAID 6 configuration using a distributed replicated volume, uh, 3 by 2 distributed replicated across those RAID 6 volumes. Uh, and you see dramatically it, it outperforms. I mean, look at the worst configuration that we have. So a small file workload, and, and again, this is it's a synthetic benchmark. It's a synthetic workload. We're doing small file sequential with uh, committed writes. Uh, so some of this is a little funny. You know, if you're thinking about, oh, I get advantages of caching with small files. Well, yeah, you do. We kind of ruled that out in these tests because we wanted to understand what the file system uh, itself could handle at the lowest level. So the, the NFS configuration there on a uh, dispersed volume, which is a erasure-coded volume built on top of RAID 6, gets a horrible performance, mm -hmm. right? So this is really important, guys. These are decisions that you can't tune to later. Mm -hmm. If you didn't make this architectural choice up front, if you instead said, oh, I want to do a... You know, even look at the third line there. I want to do a JBOD-based distributed dispersed volume on my nodes using the native client. Well, okay, but if you're running a small file workload, good luck. Yeah. Right, your read throughput's terrible. Yeah, and I don't know if you guys have ever populated your data and then had to go and redo your bri or brick configuration, but it's hours and hours of loading data again, and you lose a lot of time that way. Data has inertia, right? Yeah, yeah yep. It doesn't, doesn't like to move unless you push it really hard. Yeah, it's definitely important to get these these decisions made up front so that you don't have to go back later and, and fix them because, like we mentioned, you know, tuning around them is, is not necessarily an option whenever it comes to that large of a difference between the two workloads, you know? We take this a step further for you, so that whole efficiency idea, we actually want to see, oh, what are you getting throughput per dollar if you invest in this? And actually, the comparison here is important. Um, you'll notice what we actually have along the bottom are the two primary configurations, which are a distributed replicated volume and a distributed dispersed volume. And again, dispersed is erasure coding. Dispersed mm -hmm. is a Gluster terminology. Um, and what we look at is the comparison between what we consider a standard density and a higher density system. So the first, the, the first of each two bars is a 12-disc system, and the second is a 24-disc system in, in an analogous configuration. 
Uh, and what you find in this case is, again, if performance matters to you, your dollar is going to go a lot further if actually you invest in less dense systems in this case. So your less dense systems, your dollar gets you more performance per dollar. Uh, you'll also notice a dramatic difference between your dollar investment when you do the distributed replicated volume versus the dispersed volume. Uh, again, uh, other than the fact that we're looking at 12 versus 24 disk systems, these are the same hardware, different configurations, you're getting massively different results. Another thing that we look at in our study is we're trying to figure out what the system can handle. So we're actually interested in concurrent workloads. Uh, we, want the, we want to push the storage system itself to, to its limit. You'll see in some of the work that Ben did that uh, what, what he's looking at is more of like what, what, how it affects an individual worker. Uh, so we have a nice kind of comparison of the two here. So one thing I want to point out is you will never get the full, the full capabilities of the system without pushing your client concurrency up until you actually start maximizing throughput. Yes, question. So the question is, do, in our RAID 6 volumes, do we hardware RAID with write-back cache? That is the recommended configuration, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, in our testing in the lab, we did not have write-back cache enabled uh, because we could not test with a battery backup cache because of the, the particular lab we had. In production, yes, Red Hat recommends yep. a write-back cache, battery backup or, or uh, non-volatile memory backup. Uh, running Gluster on VMs, I don't have data to, to show. We, we, we do have some information um, about running Gluster as a backing store for VMs, which mm -hmm. Ben did some testing for. Mm -hmm. But Gluster inside of VMs, I, I'm afraid right now I don't have good performance data for that yet. Yeah, yeah. there's some tunables that are set um, whenever we do gdeploy using the, the robo.comp config file. And uh, it may be set in there. That's something that I can look at and get back to you after the presentation. But also, um, something else on write back cache, you know, it's really important to set at the controller level. Make sure that you have a battery. And um, I usually see 10 to 20% gains. So if sometimes if my battery dies and I'm running automated performance regression tests, uh, I see, boom, 20% performance hit. Uh, oh no, what was it? So the battery died and it turned off right back cache. Yeah. So you can really see the, the performance hit and it's something that you'll want to keep an eye on. And, and in one of the test scenarios that, that we'll cover here in a little bit, uh, we actually did compare right back cache on versus off ah, and you yeah. will see it did make mm -hmm. a, a difference there. Um, yes? Yeah, with SSDs we don't put them in a RAID configuration. Um, you know, we, we, we are pretty much invariably going to deploy those in a uh, JBOD configuration yep. and let the, let the data protection happen at the Gluster layer. Yep. And I have, tr I have tested with that, and I didn't see uh, a huge performance improvement, but I didn't do a lot of testing, just like Dutch, or Dustin mentioned. Um, normally with SSDs, we let Gluster do the, the protection. So what I did is I did a RAID 0 so that I could uh, get a little bit more performance out of my brick but um, I didn't have a, a huge amount of data, and I did set right back, and I didn't see a huge gain, but I did see a gain. So the next bit we want to dig into here is, is uh, when, you know, when we look at this concurrency and we start seeing, as we go up, uh, you know, particularly on the reads, we start seeing the diminishing returns. We know we're going to hit some kind of bottleneck on the system, so we want to know what that bottleneck is. You also notice the way we did these tests, the writes, we kind of hit the bottleneck right away. So we're curious what's going on underneath that causes this. So we have some subsystem metrics to look at. First thing we look at here is the network utilization, and you can see we're using squat for network utilization, right? This is where that line, the red line up at the top is a 10% threshold. So we're not, for this 32 kilobyte file, right, right, right. even at high levels of concurrency, yeah, we are, there's a 10% uh, line, and we're just barely even getting close to that. So you understand these workloads too. This, as you go down these charts, this is a write, this is a read. This is a write, this is a read, write, read, write, read. So um, the, the pattern kind of persists down there. So with, what's going on with the CPU? Again, we're barely even getting to a 25% consumption of CPU. This is an aggregate uh, across all of our servers. So we're not network bound, we're not CPU bound. What's going on with cluster? It must be the memory, it's not the memory. <laughs> <laughs> kind of looks like that chart's wrong. Um, no, there's basically, you know, the green line there is actually how much, how much memory Gluster is really consuming, how much system memory is really taken up, which is, you can see, nothing. Uh, the yellow line is how much disk cache is being used, and for 32 kilobyte files, even with high levels of concurrency, mm -hmm. we have a load of memory on these systems. We're not even getting close mm -hmm. uh, to even caching yep. uh, all that much. So let's look, look what's going on on the disk. Truly, we're disk bound. 
And you do, you do see indeed on the read operations, we are actually getting disk bound. Mm -hmm. So we know that, is that on the read operations that we start to see that curve going off, uh, we're getting there because we've hit a, a limitation on the disk. So that's a good thing to know. But what's going on with writes? Uh, ben, can you explain what's going on with writes here? So with we, we, we looked at everything, we didn't yeah. hit a bottleneck. Yeah, yeah, so with writes, there's lots of the overhead that happens. So the first thing that you need to do whenever you go to create a file is does the file exist? So you need to go out and you need to issue a lookup on all the bricks in the cluster. So once those lookups come back, then you go and you do the next operation, you do the next operation, you do the next operation. So the, the amount of overhead that, that we see with small files is actually what is taking up a lot of the time that we're seeing in that graph. So with reads, you don't have as much overhead. Uh, you know, you don't need to make sure, you just need to issue the, the read and then the first brick to respond, by default, there's, you can tune this behavior. But by default, the first brick to respond is gonna be who services that read. So with reads, a lot less overhead. With creates, a lot more overhead. Right, and so this, yeah. That's why we're maxing it out on reads and so we're not So we never see it. it as a system resource limitation because Gluster is really kind of getting in the way of these, mm -hmm. uh, these write throughputs. Um, so that starts to beg the question, when files get that small, are they really acting like files anymore? <laughs> yep, right? yep. If a file is very, very small, is it still a file? So I think that this is kind of, uh, it's an interesting thought or question because with small files, uh, it, it does tend to be a lot of overhead and it, and, it, and it is more about round trips between client and server, uh, lookups, making sure that files don't exist, and um, just different amounts of overhead that, that you see. Where what I found is that Anything from 16K, depending on your system, it can be a little smaller. Say between 16 and 4K and one byte, you're gonna see the same level of performance, uh, on creates at least. And that has to do with the amount of overhead that you get. So if we wanna move on to the next slide, Dustin, I like to think of Gluster, like my, my friend here, Ted Stevens, like a series of tubes, right? So the, the Gluster is a stack of translators. So it flows from the, the top translator, let's look at Fuse, and um, the, what it is is Gluster takes a system call and it passes the system call through each layer in the translator stack. So you can see Fuse, Performance, Translators, Distribute. Let's go back to our tubes analogy. Once we get to Distribute, it splits into three tubes. Once we get into Replicate, that splits into three more tubes. And then the file goes to the actual brick itself. So um, I really, you know, I joke with the Ted Stevens analogy, but it's a good way to visualize it. And uh, even once you get into the translator code itself, so you can see every part of the translator definition of any, or of any translator, you're gonna have a function that's called xlater fops. And what that does is that lists out the system calls that this translator acts on. So if uh, an open comes in, this, this is actually for the, the read ahead translator. So if an open call comes in, uh, it, go ahead, it goes ahead and executes read ahead open and does its thing as far as read ahead and then passes it down to the next layer in the translator stack. So uh, you know, it's that, that, that system of tubes, the, the, the IO, the system call is dumped in at the top and if the translator can act on it, it will, based on that list. Uh, if the, the system call is not in that list, it just treats it like a no-op and passes it directly to the next translator. Uh, one last thing on that previous slide. Uh, another thing that you're gonna see in the, that's required for different translators is volume options. So that's just where you can see all the volume options that can be set for a translator. So if you are interested in, you wanna look at the code, and you wanna see what what system calls a translator acts on and what options it has, that's a good way to do it. So um, with small file, there is uh, you know, some challenges and what we are trying to do with the community to, to get over those challenges is we're trying to improve the efficiency of individual calls. Uh, something that I'm gonna talk about, like a good example, is lookup optimize. Before lookup optimize, came out, 
Uh, you would issue more than one lookup per brick whenever you were doing a file create. Uh, lookup optimize takes you down to the minimum of lookups that you can do. So that's one, f one lookup per brick to make sure that the file isn't anywhere. Um, the reason that we don't just look at where the, the file hashes to is because if a brick is down, you might have a link file. So we try to stick to, to one lookup per brick. Uh, another thing we're trying to do to help improve that overhead is we're trying to store metadata in a client-side cache. Anything that you can do to reduce the trips over the wire from the client to the server is gonna, is gonna, do, is gonna be a nice performance improvement. Latency is the hobgoblin of distributed systems. So anything that we can do to destroy or lower latency uh, is better. And the next thing is like prefetch and metadata. So we have our client side cache. Um, if we know that whenever we access a file, we're gonna need X, Y, and Z chunks of metadata. So we're gonna send all of those metadata pieces with the, the, the previous call and then they can get stored in cache and they'll be there for future, call, or future calls. Uh, another thing that we're doing is we're compounding file operations. So if I'm going to do an, if I'm going to do a, a series of system calls that I know need to happen in a specific order, I can send two of them in the same frame and say if I know that I need to do a lookup and then an open, or um, there's two system calls that, that are definitely going to happen no matter what, one after the other, you can compound those file operations and you can send them in the same frame so that you're reducing round trips. Uh, something that's gonna come out with Gluster 3.3 is negative lookups. That's a way for us to do caching of lookups. So a good example is Samba. Samba is used to running on top of a local file system and it issues lots of different calls over and over and over again. Samba is very lookup heavy. So with, with negative lookups, what we'll do is we'll do the lookup the first time, we'll cache it, and then uh, subsequent lookups will be serviced from that cache. Parallel read RP is just going to uh, speed up the read RP operation. The more bricks you have, it's gonna deal with some of the problems we talked about earlier. Yeah. I know we're probably running yeah, short no, on I'm, time. I'm gonna, so. give you, I'm gonna give you a, a 20 second challenge on this yeah. slide. Just okay. I, don't, I don't wanna miss out on the, the larger yeah. file workload. Yep, exactly. So um, RAID 10 and RAID 6 recommended for bricks. TuneD profile, uh, again, RHS throughput performance, event threads. This is a theme that's been common through Gluster. Uh, Gluster started out with a lot of single threaded operations. So what we've been doing is we've been taking those single threaded operations and making them multi-threaded and doing more things in parallel. So event thread is something to look a, a good thing to look at. Lookup optimize, we touched on earlier. Uh, cache invalidation, that has to do with MD cache. It's just uh, how often to invalidate cache, stat prefetch. We also covered that one. Cool. So here's a graph of what we're seeing with tuning. So in the graph on the left, uh, we see untuned small file creates. This is 32K files. And what we're looking at is untuned versus tuned with cold cache versus tuned with hot cache. So on creates, we see that the tuning has a really great impact. That's actually a 44% improvement from the tunables. Um, but you see with the, the hot cache, we don't see much improvement because create workloads don't really have a lot to do with cache. So on reads, we see the story is a little bit different. So with reads, um, cache is very effective. So we don't see much improvement from whenever we have the tunables set, but whenever the cache is hot, and note that this cache is hot on both the server and the client. On the server, the, the small files are stored in page cache so that the, the server doesn't have to go and hit the disk. It can just send the read right off to the client and then with um, metadata is cached on the client side also. Um, another thing to talk about is uh, multi-threaded ls-l versus single-threaded ls-l. You can see our tunables were able to get from uh, what is that, about 300 seconds down to about 75 seconds. Yeah, so this is a smaller is better graph, right? Yep, so you have smaller a is better. This is time for us to run on a single client. We ran ls-lar, and those are the times. And with this, we use Ben England's small file tool where we have four clients, eight threads per client, and we're running the same ls workload, but we're doing it in parallel. And if you can see, we went from 
300 seconds to 12 seconds. So just like just Dustin mentioned, doing with. things in parallel and lots of threads, lots of workers, lots of files is going gonna, is gonna to help cluster performance. So let's move on to large file. So that second scenario I talked about early on was same configuration of servers or same, same set of servers is configure them a different way for a different workload. Let me show you why you need to configure them a different way. Uh, so again, uh, qualifying that what we are looking here is uh, throughput efficiency. What we actually find, interestingly, is that for this large file, four gigabyte workload uh, with enough concurrency to saturate the system, our dispersed volumes are actually giving us the best overall performance, which is interesting because we think of erasure coding as something that adds overhead. But from a performance efficiency standpoint and considering saturating the system, you can see that particularly on the right side of the equation that the erasure coded volume is actually giving us the best efficiency uh, configuration. Um, and again, we did this with a, a throughput per dollar so you could really see you know, what it means uh, based on your, your uh, capital investment here. Um, what you'll find on the, the less dense versus more dense servers when you're looking at the replicated volume is there's not a whole lot of difference. So you could really kind of go, you know, 12 disks, 24 disks. It's not going to make a massive difference if you need to go with replication for some reason. Um, but if you are going to go with the dispersed volume that we actually do, again, see better overall efficiency for the uh, less dense servers. I'm actually going to go back to this slide real quick because I do want to point out that first NFS line, the fourth line down. Uh, you will actually see that the performance of the NFS client uh, on a distributed replicated volume is, is pretty good. The, the, the writes and, and reads are, are pretty decent. So you may actually find if you need to run NFS uh, that you'll want to do NFS on a replicated volume, not on a dispersed volume. Whereas if you're running the Fuse client, you may want to run the dispersed volume instead of replicate. <coughs> Again, client concurrency is important. So we really kind of have to push this thing uh, until we find the edges of the system, but where are those edges? You're going to see these patterns look a little bit different than they do for the small files. Mm, yeah, much different. That's right. Well, yeah, much different. So again, uh, when we look at the network, uh, mostly we're, we're staying well below, but you will find that we do appear to start bottlenecking on that network once that client concurrency gets high enough. We're not quite hitting a line, but that's because this is network, and there's a lot of like iffy overhead going on there. But we have enough data to say that we believe that what's happening here is that we are constrained to the network on our right operations. But our reads still have a little bit of room to grow. Uh, so where are reads getting bottlenecked? Uh, let's take a look at the CPU. Again, the CPU, the CPU patterns look different than they did with the small file, but we're still only around that 25% mark. So we're really not doing too bad on CPU. Memory patterns look a little different, but you'll notice that yellow line is, again, disk cache. So the used memory is the green line, which you can barely see because the system's not really using any memory. Uh, but the disk cache is actually being used pretty heavily with these large files. We're pushing enough data into the system now that we can really fill that disk cache. These drops that you can see are actually just part of the testing process where we, this is a write operation, then we drop caches. This is a read operation, we drop caches. So each one of those is just us purposefully dropping caches across the system. So let's take a look at the disks. And at the disks, we do start to see here that uh, on our read operation, our bottleneck is the disk. So interestingly, at about the same time, we're hitting very close to network and disk uh, bandwidth bottlenecks uh, for, for reads and writes. So we're, they're actually configured very, very close as far as uh, the throughput capabilities of the disk and the network. Yes? We, we've done some testing with the all SSD, uh, not with InfiniBand, but we were doing uh, 40 gig uh, Ethernet. Yeah testing, but I don't, I don't have any I data do. with InfiniBand. I have InfiniBand data in 40 gig. Uh, I've done Rocky, I've done IP over IB, and I've done InfiniBand testing. I'm so sure talk to you like crazy yep, about it afterwards. I'll talk to you afterwards. Uh, I have some data out there that I can show you. So talk to us, Ben, about what's, what's going on with these large file workloads. Right, so Gluster was actually designed for large file sequential workloads. So we're, Gluster's always been pretty good at that. So for our, our bricks, just like uh, Dustin mentioned, we can use EC or RAID 6. EC, if we're massively parallel and we have lots of threads slash workers, lots of files, uh, we tend to see EC perform really well. Where if we have uh, less workers, threads, files, uh, or even single-threaded workloads, RAID 6 tends to do a little bit better. Uh, the, Tune D profile we set is RHS high throughput. Uh, it sets read ahead on bricks. That's really important for sequential reads. Uh, the deadline scheduler sort of helps out both reads and writes. 
and then it sets VM dirty ratio to help more aggressively reclaim dirty pages. But I'm going to keep pushing you forward yep. just so we get Jumbo the frames, also important. Use it if you can. <laughs> so writes, uh, you can see the improvement. Most of it's due to Jumbo frames. Read, that's uh, mostly due to read ahead on the brick devices. Um, this is a quick formula that I use to sort of guesstimate performance and how many nodes I'm going to need. Um, since we're using replication, and replication is done client side on writes, uh, we take the, the slowest of your your, your, your cluster cluster is only as fast as the slowest piece. So we take the slowest piece, usually it's network or disk. We divide it by the number of replicas. We multiply it by 0.7, so that's about 30% overhead on writes. If we do the formula that goes back to 420, look at the graph above, multiply 420 by four, comes out to about 1600. Yeah, these it, numbers come out really jive. consistent with the numbers that he was showing, the tested yep. numbers. And reads, since reads are on every brick, we don't have to worry about replication. We just multiply it by 0.6. The overhead is a little more. Like Dustin showed, you see a lot more CPU uh, usage in reads. So we have a little bit more overhead, and, and that also jives. So takeaways, Justin, you want to or Dustin, you want to talk about the top one? Yeah, so you see, I mean, there are, there are some nuances in here. You know, in my testing, because we're doing this, this saturation type testing with really kind of pushing up the concurrency of the clients, what we do find in that case is the erasure coded on JBot outperforms the replication uh, on RAID 6 when you've got that high worker concurrency. Yep, and same thing goes for repli replica 2 on RAID 6. Whenever you have less, concern, less concurrency, it outperforms EC on JBot. So and think, they can also apply to the NFS client yep, as well as we found. Yep, do the way the NFS is architected. You go from the client to the mount, and then the mount actually goes on the back end to get the file. So that's one of the reasons that we see NFS performing a little worse on EC volumes. Um, also, read ahead and jumbo frames, they're really important with large file sequential workloads. Jumbo frames on both the servers and the clients, if you can get them set. Uh, sometimes you need to talk to your network admin. And again, you know, start with the workload when designing your storage cluster. The proper brick architecture from the start will yield far better performance than any of the tunables mentioned. Uh, design in a way that avoids problems. Don't try to tune your way out of them. I think of it like a doctor, what do they say? Uh, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So, you know, yeah, sort of take work that. Up and you'll never tune your way out of a out of a performance problem again if you if you architect it incorrectly. Yep. So all of that was synthetic workload stuff. So I'm, I'm going to give you um, a, a one example that we did of that CCTV workload, uh, so that you can kind of see how this applies uh, to something real world. Can I take the synthetic stuff and does it does it really translate to something real? This is this is good as con as real as we can get when we're kind of running benchmarks. The CCTV workload does uh, concurrent streams of simulated cameras of high definition. And what we're really looking for is concurrency. We want to know is how many simultaneous camera streams can the system support. And we want that to be as high as possible because we want our investment to be efficient here. But this, this runs because it's simulating a real world con uh, condition. It also runs a interference workload that does a random smaller read operations. Mm -hmm. So it ends up becoming latency sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, so what we see that first line that peaks out really early hits, a, hits the, the latency curve quite early and, and stops us at a low number of concurrent cameras is actually a uh, replica on RAID 6 configuration. Well, that's interesting. That didn't turn out to be our best use case uh, or our best configuration for this use case. So we do find going to that orange line, the orange line actually represents our initial go uh, at doing a dispersed volume on JBot. And you can see we got much better results. Everything else was kind of incrementally trying things. One of the things we did try here was write back cache on the RAID layer. Uh, so what we actually used RAID 0 single disk, but we were able to leverage the RAID right back cache because we configured it that way. We get about a 10% performance improvement doing that. And then we also took some NVMe drives that we had in the system and configured a, a layer of cache, a layer up in the system. So each node actually had a block level NVMe uh, right back cache that was configured. And that got us about another 15% performance improvement. So that kind of became the target configuration we were looking at for finding the best overall cluster setup for this, this uh, streaming uh, video configuration. And there's, there's actually some interesting things to talk about that Ben's discovered about, you know, kind of why that's happening, but we'll probably reserve that for, for another time since yeah, we're yep. short on time. Okay, so the next thing that I want to talk about as far as use cases go is hyperconverged cluster and rev or just virtualization. So this is a wildly different than any of the use cases that we've talked about. 
virtual, or virtual machines tend to be more random workload uh, than the, the sequential workloads that we talked about with large file, and they don't have the metadata overhead that you see with small files. So uh, here's a, a nice diagram of the infrastructure. Hosted Engine is what we use to deploy Rev. Um, you can see that Hosted Engine and that Rev VM are uh, sort of together. So the Rev Manager, whenever, way back when, whenever we bought Kumernet, the, the Rev Manager used to have to run on a Windows system, but, uh, and it may or may not have had to be bare metal. But over time, what we did is we ported that code to Java, and now it actually runs as a VM inside the cluster. So you don't need to have separate hardware for your manager. It also runs on Linux now, which woohoo. And um, it's, it's really easy to deploy using that hosted engine solution. So with uh, one quick thing, note that there's three nodes there. Uh, we've been deploying uh, nodes in, in sets of three. Right now we support three nodes, but we're continuing to enhance support. Hopefully we'll have six, nine, and maybe more in the future. And note that all those are in the cluster volume. So um, just like we said, storage and compute on the same systems, there's a cost advantage. Uh, it's really nice to manage. You know, if you guys, everybody here I'm assuming, uh, has worked on Linux, or used Linux tools, you use the same Linux tools to manage your storage, to manage your virtual machines, to, to manage your system. So you don't have to have a, a, a storage admin and a virtualization admin and, you know, you can all use the same stuff. And this is so cool. I'm really excited about this. I was actually able to get the deployment of a fully set up, ready to go, hyper-converged uh, rev, rev res cluster using two commands. So just gdeploy, uh, and then you point it to robo.conf. Robo.conf is a file that we give you that has some examples, and you just go through and you fill it out for your environment. And then hosted engine dash dash deploy config append. Uh, there's a file called heanswers.conf that we also give you. You go through, edit it, uh, set it up for your environment. So Two commands, takes about 45 minutes. Some of that 45 minutes is downloading the ISO image for the Rev Manager. Uh, here's some of the some performance data. So the first one is sort of like our control. That's me running on just a, a regular mount that was on one of the systems outside of VMs. Uh, the second one is one VM, two VM, three VMs. And these are all on the same hypervisor. I just scaled up on the same hypervisor. Uh, a couple interesting things to note is you see a slightly better write performance whenever you're outside of the VM versus inside the VM. Um, but something that I found strange, I still don't quite understand yet, and I'm gonna be digging into it in the near future, is why reads were faster on a VM versus on just the Gluster mount. Uh, we can see that reads and writes both scale linearly and um, writes are kind of slow on the sharded VMs. Yeah, so, go ahead, I was just gonna say, we'd kind of expect this blue line to be about the same. As mm -hmm. This is a control and this is a, 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 a VM running a single load. We'd expect that to be about the same, but it's actually better, so that's yeah. interesting. Yep, so that's interesting. Also, go ahead. Uh, yeah, these are thin provisioned, uh, the, the bricks are thin provisioned LVs. Uh -huh. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, so I create the whole file and have it already there, but yeah, that's definitely something to note. Um, also, we have a bug open against sharded, uh, sharded volumes for, for VMs. That that's only about 70 meg megabytes per second inside the VM. It's about 80 outside the VM. Uh, the performance should be better. So if you guys are gonna be using this hyper-converged configuration, uh, I would suggest testing with sharding and without. And as we, this configuration, this setup, this architecture, as it grows, uh, we're definitely gonna fix this. We're gonna fix some other issues. I'm gonna be able to explain that. Uh, shameless self-promotion. This is the tool that I use to collect all my data. It's called GBench. 
if you guys want to contribute or use GBench for, for your testing, uh, I'd love to see it. It basically wraps IOZone, small file, and FIO. It gathers multiple iterations. It averages it, does some other it. statistical stuff. Yeah, a lot of the work that you would do to run multiple iterations or to, or to run kind of the same, run different uh, tools the same way, mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot of that effort out for you. So yep. We're kind and of at the, yeah, we're really at the, at the yeah, end, at so the end. we're going to say thank you, guys. Of course, yeah, thanks, social guys. media plugs. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And I have, I'm, let me, let me close out with uh, just, just a couple little things as you're leaving. Uh, first of all, highly recommend you guys install the Summit mobile app. That's a QR code to take you to it. Uh, please review our session. Please review all the sessions. We're always trying to make Red Hat Summit better for you guys. Mm -hmm. So definitely put in your reviews. Get the, 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 the tool installed to do that. Um, there's also this cool thing going around. Pick one of these up. Um, you can check out what we're doing storage-wise around. And we have some special swag for everybody who attended this session. If you're interested, uh, come grab one of my business cards, go to the Gluster booth, tell them Dustin sent you, and there's a special piece of swag. They may not have it yet. You may have to check with them a little bit later today or tomorrow, but grab a business card, go visit them. I'll leave them here so you guys can grab them easy. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone, for coming.